So good morning. My name is Gary Coates. I am here because I am a working colorist. What is a colorist? Um, I've been called many things. Uh, I began my career, I was called a film timer. Ruby and Lambert met me when I was a film timer at a motion picture laboratory. I, I, I came to San Francisco in 1975 as a student. In those days, I didn't know what these crafts were. I didn't want to be a cinematographer, an editor, or a colorist, or a sound mixer. I wanted to be a filmmaker. And San Francisco in the 1970s was this uh, great place for avant-garde experimental filmmaking. That's what I wanted to do at that time. I, I've left that. I'm, I'm now a documentarian. But that was the place to go and to learn at, at the various schools there. I went to San Francisco State, but there was also the San Francisco Art Institute and the College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland and all the junior colleges. The, uh, every, every, every school had a program, a, a music uh, school in Oakland called Mills College that trained our great, some great American composers had a fantastic film department. And you could, you could study film in all of these. And it was a very exciting time. And, and it was kind of like the golden age of American cinema in the 1970s. Many, many academics and scholars say that that was our best time from like say, 72, The Godfather, and, and things kind of ending uh, with uh, the, the arrival of Star Wars and Jaws that completely changed the film industry into a, a big uh, sort of thing. But before that, in that little window of time, both in the dominant industry and in, in small cinema, it was independent personal expression. So then I wanted to be a filmmaker. Came to San Francisco. I needed a job to go to school. I went and applied a job at a film laboratory. They hired me and gave me an, an opportunity to, to work myself through school. They apprenticed me with a man named Winston Fong, who taught me color timing. What's color timing? Sit down, you'll learn. <laughs> Winston was born in Hong Kong. Uh, so I am returning my apprenticeship back to Hong Kong. Uh, in the laboratory I worked with, there were four Chinese men. And uh, whatever Cantonese I speak, I learned from them. <laughs> and I won't. I won't say the, the naughty stuff they taught me, but so Niho Ma <laughs> and Shishi. Uh, that's it. That's all I know. Uh, uh, it's Cantonese. Um, so that, my, my practice began with about 10 years in the film laboratory. Um, in those days, you could only do very simple things, and we're going to learn uh, how to do some of the concepts of primary color correction in, in the history of these tools. Like the very simple tools that we used in the film laboratory, if you can do that much with this one control, you make your film look very good. My next uh, period in the uh, cinema career was telecine, the transfer of film to videotape. And uh, the telecine era was a, a nice 20 years. Um, and Da Vinci in those days was a device that controlled the telecine. It was a very large, powerful computer that cost about a half a million US. So there weren't a lot of these around, and then there weren't a lot of us who got to use them. So there was this sort of special priesthood of a few of us in the United States who got the chairs for that. I had had a good uh, reputation with my clients when I was a film timer at the laboratory, and a lot of them said, well, you ought to, you ought to hire him to do the film transfers to, to videotape. So I made that next step. Uh, film, of course, has, has, it has completely died away, but the arrival of digital cinema has, has changed things. So in the last 10 years, I've worked almost entirely in digital cinema. That's when all of these new tools come along. But many of the concepts of color correction are the same in each of those eras. So uh, what is color grading? I, I'll now go through and uh, uh, sh uh, show what it is. I, your class is called a, a course in color correction. That is one segment of the practice. The entire practice encompasses many other things. And I re 
prefer to say that what we are learning today is the new craft of cinematography editing. So welcome aboard. Um, I'm going to sit. Uh, I'm going to face here. I've, I have a microphone. If anyone has trouble hearing me, you can do this, and I will try to speak louder or more clearly or more directly. Uh, we'll be filming the course, videotaping the course, um, and the class will be edited. So you will be able to see when I've been doing some keystrokes and, and things and the associated with what I'm doing in this timeline. My class is a Da Vinci project, and that project will live on this computer, so the, the class can always open up the computer and, and step through the lessons. Um, so that's all available. I'll be using footage from various projects. Um, we are going to see a lot of red files that are provided by the red camera company. These will have the log. Uh, uh, log files, and we'll, we'll begin by trying to get the log files to look right. Using LUTs, but I will show you how you make your own LUT. You know, basically, do the thinking and don't let the LUT do the thinking for you. Um, then, um, we'll, we'll get into, uh, we'll, we'll start with, a, uh, a, we'll take a break in about one hour, would you say, about do you think 10.30 or? Okay. So we'll break at 10.30. I'm going to try to spend the next hour teaching the basics uh, and the theory, the color theory. This is useful to you. You're not required to master it. You don't have to be experts in color science. Um, but I'm telling you it, uh, the color science, so you, you have a conceptual idea of what we're doing. And, and trying to fit these concepts into an industrial role. Although we're filmmakers and you know, we might just show our, our films on YouTube or to our parents. Um, that's the only people who watch my, film, <laughs> my family. Um, there is a correct way to do it. There's a way to do it that, that ensures uh, that the industry will present it. And so I'm also going to try to show you how to make program that uh, can pass inspection at a television station or a studio that, to distribute your film. Um, I've been dinged myself. I, I, I got busted on uh, Toy Story 2, and I'll, I'll tell you about certain problems there. They rejected my work, and I had to, I had to redo some things. So, um, that, because I violated uh, certain practices. So I'll, we will teach you what those practices are. Uh, I like to say all colors are correct, and, and that's sort of my philosophy of life. But not all colors are appropriate for the media they are presented on. So you need to make color appropriate for what will work in film, digital cinema, television, standard definition, high definition, and ultra high definition, and the web. These each all have different requirements. But there are certain controls you can do universally in your grading that will pretty much get your work acceptable in any of those forms of distribution. All right. And how's that light? Are you able to get a, a fairly noise free? We can show you noise reduction if, if we need to. <laughs> All right, master class. Um, what is color grading? Color grading is the craft of cinematography enhancement. It includes color correction. That's pretty basic, uh, the core part of it is, is color correction. It also includes the task of matching shots and cameras, particularly if you have worked with different cameras on one documentary, or the same camera on many different locations. One of the uh, programs I'm going to be showing you was a documentary that aired on the most recent Oscars telecast. It's a segment called Cinema Around the World. And it was a Sony camera, at the F7, used in Paris, Beijing, um, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, Italy, 
a couple other places. And the task was to try to make the whole show look like it was shot with the same camera. So part of this task of color grading is matching. Matching camera to camera and matching shots within a sequence and matching sequences within a movie such that you feel that you are experiencing a unified look. Now, when Dan was here, he probably told you uh, our sad lot as sound mixers and designers is nobody knows we did anything. Um, if you're really good at the craft, you're not in the way. You know, you, everything is smooth and balanced and your audience accepts a, a unified film experience without the soundtrack or the color getting out of the way. So Dan and I have similar tasks to get out of the way of the story, make it match, unless the narrative tells us to do otherwise. So we'll talk about that. Um, maybe I'll make that big screen. Part of the job of color correcting or color grading or color finishing or cinematography editing is making scenes balance. So A camera, B camera, C camera, D camera, it's as if they all look like they had the same light. If the A camera had uh, a highlight that's too dark and the C camera had a highlight that's too bright, you need to make the C light and the A light have the same highlight level. This, might, this camera might not have been balanced, so on the A angle, when the editor cuts it together, there's a jump. It's just, it's a jolt that A doesn't match B. So the colorist uh, will put the two images up side to side in the split screen and try to match up the, the, the color cast and the brightness, the hue, and the saturation. Um, I have been thanked many a time uh, by worrisome uh, filmmakers that this one's gonna match. Um, this task of color correction can happen at any time too. So if you are nervous about this sort of thing, if as you're editing, you feel like, I don't think this is going to work, you can consult with a colorist and, and do a pre-grade and a, and a tackle or a, a struggle with a particular scene. And let's get that to match. And then editorially in the editing process, you may say, you know what, this scene will work. So let's, let's keep it in the movie and then we'll do a final color grade later. So scene balancing, very important part of it. Hello, where are us? Styling. Now, while I just said that what Dan in sound mix and I in color is to try to get out of the way of the story, maybe the story needs a little more drama sometimes. Um, maybe something has to have uh, an emotional effect. Uh, I'm currently working on a documentary about Mata Hari, the, uh, the spy in World War I. It's the 100th anniversary of her execution in, in October. So uh, a Dutch company is making this film to come out. She was a Dutch citizen originally, and, and there's, the Dutch are very interested in, in bringing back her history. Uh, so there's this modern documentary. It's shot with modern cameras, and, uh, and the edit I looked at a couple weeks ago with the director, and it looks like um, a soap opera that was just shot yesterday. So styling is imperative to save this project, to make it look like, to evoke something of the history of 100 years ago. Uh, on day three, I will show you the techniques that I, I did to try to make um, the Mata Hari film look more historical. And um, it's, it's a very complicated system of, of nodes that I'm using. So we'll get into that later. But, but styling is very important. Uh, the, uh, you know, anyone who's seen a Juan Carl Y film knows it's his film. And, and his signature, his authorship is partly the color and, and the styling. Lord of the Rings has uh, a style to it that, um, you know, it's unmistakable. You, you see one frame of the film, you know where it's from because of, of the, the blue cast. It's, it's a completely incorrect color in that there's blue contamination in black, but that's the style, that's the story. I'm going to show you the correction, you know, make a good pure black, and then bend the rule, you know, go 
away from the, the correct, but don't break the rule. Don't make a color which will get you dinged at, at the, uh, like I did it on Pixar with Count Zurg in, in uh, Toy Story 2. So styling, this is where the colorist is now more and more part of the authorship of the film. Um, and, that, and I think it's what you might find the most exciting part of, of learning how to do this. Um, it, it might be your form of expression. Okay. Fixing the picture. All right. Uh, part of being a polite, politically savvy colorist is don't embarrass the cinematographer in front of the director. Um, keep your mouth shut, but make a useful suggestion. Oh, I see a spot on the lens. Would you like me to try to fix that? <laughs> oh, uh, we could do this. Uh, oh, it's a little shaky. Would, uh, would you mind some stabilization? Could, could we see if that um, helps it? Would you mind if I pushed in a little bit? I, I think maybe a little tighter. We, it might be a little more dramatic, and especially getting that mic boom out of the shot. You want to, should I remove the mic boom? Okay. Um, is it me or the, are the actor's eyes look out of focus? <laughs> Would you like me to sharpen the eyes? Okay. Yeah, when he's moving, okay. No, the eye moved over there. We'll, we'll follow the eye. We'll, we'll focus. We'll show you how to do that. Um, some things you can't fix. Uh, when we put on the, uh, the Oscar show one, there's a problem I was not able to fix. Um, oh, you photograph the copywritten advertisement for the movie Silence in the background, and you were supposed to put that out of focus? Would you like me to draw a mat and put that out of focus for you? Oh, you, you filmed uh, uh, an ex-convict who you're afraid will sue you and you didn't get a release form? Would you like me to track his face across the screen and put it out of focus? Oh, yeah, okay, we'll do that. So fixing the picture is, is one, of the, one of the things that's now possible. It didn't, didn't used to be. And serving the narrative. Always... Be part of the team of the filmmakers. It's, it's not your movie and you really want to put that green uh, in the background. You, no, you, your job is to work with the editor and director and serve the narrative. Be part of the storytelling. Be part of a team. You know, you're, you're one craftsperson in a team of craftsperson. Be on the same side. So imperative, always serve the narrative. The wrong color correction might be what serves the narrative. Proper presentation for medium. Uh, and you'll learn a bit later in, in what that involves. So, for example, a lot of my clients have to um, make things that will work for broadcast television in the United States. And various uh, d uh, stations, PBS has one set of restrictions. National Geographic has another set of restrictions. ABC Television had even more restrictions. So uh, you will be given a technical specs document from whoever you're delivering to, and it lists all of these things about video signal and audio signal. So you have to make uh, your color work uh, so it will present well for television, which is the most restrictive. Broadcast television uh, has the most limits for us. The, the reasons are technical. When uh, a television signal goes out over the way, uh, airwaves, terrestrial broadcast, it has a dark side and a bright side. The bottom of the scale, are dark colors, like dark reds and dark blues, can interfere with the video synchronization pulse. Have you watched a television where suddenly your set goes like this? The picture wiggles? It's because a dark color is interfering with the video subcarrier. The signal loses sync. In the United States, uh, the Federal Communications Commission would have taken away the license of the broadcaster. 
It, so the broadcaster is responsible for making sure things like that don't get out. So if there's somebody at the station who's looking at your program before they put it on the air, and they see something like that, and they'll ding it, or they'll, they'll, they'll mark a, an error, and they'll send it back for color correction. That's the, on the bottom side. The top side, the very bright colors, a super luminant yellow may look great for that cereal box commercial you're working on, but, or, or count Zerg's eyes in, uh, in, in Toy Story 2. Um, that color, in, if it gets too bright, a very bright yellow, orange, magenta, pink can interfere with the audio subcarrier of, of a telecast. So if you're at home watching a television show and suddenly a bright uh, color comes on the screen and you hear a buzz in the audio, you've got a transgression. The color interfered with the audio. So um, you, it's not supposed to happen. There is a very simple technique here you're going to learn. All of us can make these things work for television. If it works in television, it'll, it'll work within the larger gamut of film or digital cinema. And in most cases, it will work for web delivery. Web delivery, there's, there's a protocol for what colors work, are web safe. I've never had anything rejected by um, a, a web site. So because that, that broadcast safe. So making things broadcast safe for um, currently high definition television. Um, and we're still working on ultra high definition. No one's given me the, the instructions yet on what is safe on, you know, so the industry hasn't even quite settled yet on what ultra high definition should look like. So I may, I just made some shows that are on Chinese television now. I hope they passed. <laughs> um, serving the narrative, I'm going backwards. Well, it's making deliverables. Um, it isn't necessarily the job of a colorist, but, but some colorists are now taking on the job of making a digital cinema package, a DCP. And you can do that from uh, Resolve. If you want to make your own DCP, you can use this application to do that. The DCP, digital cinema package, is what is currently playing in cinemas. So it's a computer drive, and you, your program is um, uh, it, it's converted from television color space into a color space for digital cinema, and sound is, is locked. But you can, you can present that. You can also, from Resolve, you can print to a, or record to a videotape recorder. If you, if you were mastering for videotape, you could, you could play it from this. So I don't make deliverables myself, but some colorists do. They'll make high definition tape, DCPs, uh, Blu-ray discs, DVD discs. Uh, more frequently, I'm making uh, Vimeo uh, MPEG-4 files. So it's a bit tricky here. You can't actually make the MP4 from Resolve. You have to output an H.264 QuickTime and then go into Premiere and then make your MPEG-4. Um, so that's, that's what a deliverable will be. All right, quality control and then as a colorist, you should be able to read all the video scopes and measure your work and, and be able to sign off on a piece of paper to a technical inspector. Um, it, this passes all of your, your tech specs. That is a general overview of the color grading practice, which I now call cinematography editing. Part one, this is what we're going to do today, some of this today. <laughs> um, I wrote this a couple of weeks ago, and I, I thought I was going to spend most of today doing this lecture. And then I saw Dan was doing all these great hands-on things. So we've changed the course. You're, you're actually going to do some stuff. So we're going to get as far as 1 and 2 today. Uh, you will learn color theory and then primary color grading. And we're going to do 5. We'll skip to 5 so you can get into using DaVinci. And this afternoon, you're going to be working. You're going to be doing primary color grading on red files this afternoon. Or did any of you bring your own work? You have. Some of you, ha if you have brought your own work, or um, you can bring that too. And you can, you can, that could be your project. And um, you can use the red files if you want. 
what we do with the red files will live in this project. So you can always come back and see what we did in this room with the red files. And you could be working in the other room on your own project. Uh, the advantage of that is then I can take a look at what you've done and maybe you know, suggest something and uh, or say, this is a good idea. This, why, why should you try this? So uh, you're, you're welcome to do that. At minimum, your project should have come over as a single QuickTime. Did, have any of you brought your project as a single QuickTime? Yes. Did any of you bring your project as a Final Cut Pro or a Premiere project, but not as an export? You've, you've all made an export. Okay, good. I will teach you how to, um, if, if you had a pre, uh, Premiere project, how you could take it from the project and then, and then bring your project in to resolve. But that, that is another lesson. But it would be more effective if, if we um, uh, show you how to bring that in and cut it up. So that will be in part five, using DaVinci Resolve. I'll show you how you can import your project. Uh, 9.50, we're going to go to 10.30 without a break. If, if someone needs to take a break, please uh, help yourselves. But I'm going to keep uh, talking till 10.30. Uh, color theory. Oh, and part two, this is kind of what we're going to try to do tomorrow. Uh, what we'll do tomorrow, first off, is secondary color correction and enhancement tools. So that, that will be using noise reduction, focus techniques, fixing problems. I'll show you how to fix film dirt, how to track windows. Windows are shapes. We'll teach you how to use shapes. Secondary color grading is, is shapes and lighting, how to relight a shot. Um, how to use the curve editor. So the real basic work, without be turning into a professional colorist, if you can learn parts of two, three, and four there, you're going to be in good shape to make your film look really good. And I'll, I'll show you how to make a broadcast safe, and then you're, you're a long way into to doing, doing well. Day two, I would like to bring in the uh, Oscar show project I did and show you how I would approach it. And uh, for those of you who don't want to be a color grader, but want to learn how to talk with a color grader, I'm going to show you how to give color graders notes within a Resolve project, such that the grader can open your project. Say, for example, you were working on a film here, and you wanted to hire a colorist in San Francisco. You could send the project with these notes, and say that person was me. I could open it up, and I'd see your notes. And I will have taught you how to talk to me, and I could, in a little bit of time, uh, attend to what you need. Um, and then how, if any of you aspire to be a colorist, please let me know, and then I'll, I will give you a lesson three there, how to lead as a colorist. You'll, you'll sort of see it a bit in what I do, but um, unless you're going to be a colorist, I, I think we may skip part three there. Class practice and keyboard shortcuts, those we will do through, through day one and two. Part three, this would be our third day. Uh, we're going to go through the look treatments I did for the Matahari movie. I'll show you some very basic techniques to make your, your film do have interesting looks. Um, and uh, just quite simply, how to use a lot to get a very interesting film look without, without having to do much work. You don't have to think too much about it. You can immediately apply a lot. And there are a bunch of presets in Da Vinci's gallery, which I think are ridiculous for the most part, but there are one or two that are kind of good. We'll open that up, and you can see how to explore it. But I want to show you how to make your own. And then additional cl uh, class practice with Resolve. That I, I thought uh, on the third day you could come in and, and do that. But I think instead of the additional pr practice, we're going to look at your own projects on the third day. And we're going to just, you know, if we can um, t take notice of your work and if, if you, any special pro problems, we'll, we'll spend more time with your own, own film. So that's a preview of our, our next couple of days. All right, we're into part one. This, these are the fundamental practices of, um, of the craft. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about the tools of the trade. Um, the first aspect of the trade is the grading environment. Um, this room is, is very appropriate for a grading environment. It's 
you mostly work in the dark when you're color grading. This is actually a little more ambient light than I normally use. And in, in that picture there is, is also going to be uh, too much. But what, what's important here is the, the color grading monitor. A calibrated grading monitor is, is sort of your standard um, and, and your predictor of what color will look like. That, that monitor you see in the picture is mine. It's a, a Flander Scientific. Uh, it's made in China and sold in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it is the most common monitor in practice in the United States now. And it is calibrated at the factory, so you know that uh, it is reproducing color appropriate for th um, the industry. Um, um, that used to be the principal reason people spent a lot of money to go to a studio, because they didn't have a, a calibrated monitor. The great news today is that the Mac displays, particularly retina displays, are so good and so predictable that you don't really have to buy a, a, a studio monitor anymore. You, your, your monitors are really pretty reliable. And you know, with, we always had uh, clients and filmmakers make a decision based on one monitor and how it looked on that monitor. Um, but for the most part, if people are seeing things on the web, they're not looking at it on a television set. Um, so this is, at best, a prediction of um, how your, your film will look on television broadcasts. I always follow my films to um, um, film screenings. So if a client has made a DCP, I'm inspecting the results in, in film festivals. Uh, with one exception, Ruby, in, in, in Chinatown in San Francisco, I've had great experience lately um, of clients' films looking like, in, in the theater, looking like what they saw on a, a graded monitor. So I, can, as a working colorist, can give you confidence that what you see here is what you will get in, in cinema. Uh, Ruby's most recent film I watched on uh, the plane coming over, and so Cathay Pacific is, uh, the, that little screen is, is accurate. It's good. And this was what? was perfect. Yeah, yeah. So it can be right. The next tool set um, is the color control services. Th this is the Resolve panels from Blackmagic Design. Again, that's like a $30,000 US appliance. There are not many of these out there. Um, I trained UC Berkeley School of Journalism in California on theirs. There's one corporate office in San Francisco that has one. And then there's one colorist in San Francisco who has it. It's a nice, a nice thing to have, but it's just a very expensive output of buttons that you could have in your head learning hotkey keystrokes. So it's my goal to teach you how to use your hands with a uh, keyboard and mouse and not spend a lot of money on equipment. Another Resolve panel is the one you see on the screen. This is what the one that I own in my own office. Um, now, I do mostly keyboard and mouse, but it does, it does give me quick access to some things. So I have to work fast with my clients, so I did buy it for myself. You don't need it, again. The other devices are, are tangent panels. These are a company in the UK. Um, Sam and I were discussing the Ripple, which is a, a little strip of three trackballs. And that's a good price, and that's not a bad device. If, if you wanted a limited amount of purchase uh, to give you the trackball, if you like grading with trackballs, that's the thing you get. You know, that, that, that's worth it. Avid Artist Control, Avid makes its own color uh, control panel, and it's pretty good. Um, um, not terribly, it's, it's good for working if you have an Avid editorial application and you like to color in Final Cut, or rather Resolve and Avid. And there is an application to, uh, that can be uh, downloaded to use an iPad. An iPad can be your controller. Um, I haven't used it myself, my colleague, colleague uses it. So that's another tool of the trade. Um, Scopes, very important part of the trade. 
Um, so there are four in uh, resolve. This is a vector scope. This measures color saturation and hue and, and such. The most important color in cinema is black. And black goes right through the middle there. So in trying to make a pure color corrected image, trying to have pure black, no uh, residual chroma in black is a good beginning point. So try to, um, using the uh, primary color corrector, make a clean black and a clean white. Of course, you won't see white on there because it's not a saturated color. The vector scope has a clock of colors, magenta, blue, cyan, green, yellow, and red. Um, what this signal is, is measuring color bars. So this is peak saturation hitting all of these boxes. Uh, this is this line here and this line here. That's residual technology from the standard def, uh, analog television era. It, it, it was called um, quadrature. You, you, we, in t uh, US television, NTSC, you might have had a huge shift. So the, the, the idea was to line up those two lines there. You don't need to worry about that anymore. We don't have that, that system. Um, this is a pretty important one, and, and you want to use this to, I, chiefly, I think, to get your black color purity right. And, and when you're getting into working on skin tone, the angle of a skin tone is anywhere between here and here. And we'll talk about what is the correct skin tone color uh, at some point. This, to me, is the most important scope. The parade scope will give you an RGB and signal and it is measuring from 0 to 120, you know, 1,023. Those are units of 10-bit uh, color. There are 1,024 steps of 10-bit of color. They loosely uh, correspond in video as 0 to 100. And when we get into the broadcast safe thing, up here at 120 and 130, they're not even on the scope here. Uh, that's, that's where you get into broadcast legal problems. And, and going below zero into minus 20, that's where you also get, get into trouble. But what, if, if you don't use any scope but this one, this is a, the one, and we'll, we'll get into the pictures. You'll see how we will make a, we'll level off the bottoms to make a black. We'll level off the tops to make it pure white. The waveform monitor is, okay, this is component video. Red, green, and blue are separate. This is composite video. Television was initially a black and white signal. Then when color television came along, they didn't want to have people buy new television sets. So they developed a system where you still had an illuminous portion of the signal, and you lay, uh, layered the chrominance signal on top of that. So that's a compositing of luminance and chrominance, um, also called 422, or, and we'll get into that a bit later. And then this measures a composite signal going from 0 to 1023. That little step there, that flat step there, is 7.5 IRE. That's bottom black video. Um, but anyway, scopes are very important in the measuring of the signal and, uh, and also in, in determining what is a uh, correct color. A very important tool and a good one for you to know how to use. This is a grading environment. That's my home office. Um, I, use, I don't usually work it that dark. I let uh, in a certain, about 10% ambient daylight. Um, and when the day gets dark, I turn on a backlight. So the idea there is you have not 
there isn't color contamination coming in, bouncing off your carpet or your walls, influencing how you perceive color. Uh, my home office is painted 50% neutral gray. When it gets dark, I have a backlight. I backlight my monitors so I rest the eyes. Having, having a light behind your monitor gives your, you have less eye strain. And it also calibrates your eyes. It keeps your eyes as a, sort of a compass. It keeps you looking at a constant color daylight. So that's the environment. Now, why I have three monitors? The one on the left is my grading monitor. The one in the middle is my uh, user interface working monitor. It's 4K because I'm beginning to get some 4K work. Um, the one on the right is just a, a small monitor that I use just for my scopes. And you can see the, the interface glowing there too. And uh, So generally working that kind of light and, and um, in that environment, it's a good idea to get out of the chair every 20 minutes and rest your eyes. Um, because as a colorist, you're going to be, uh, or a filmmaker working on your own color, you're going to need to hang in there for four to eight hours at a time. So, uh, and also, you, you'll want some nice sound system. If I have a, uh, external speakers, I, I don't have a 5.1 sound system in my office, but you may want one too. OK, fundamental practice, tool of the trades, color bars, and signals. Um, hello. Where is it? That is color bars. This is what we use to calibrate monitors. Um, I, I don't know if you can see it. At, uh, on this monitor, there is a light difference between here and here. Oh, you can see that. Very good. Thank you. There are three st strips of black here. They're called pluge. And th a, this is a calibrated monitor because I can see there is this is barely brighter than the black here. On this monitor, I do not see a difference between those. And on this monitor, you barely, you barely see it. So this is probably a little too dark. But on your own Macintosh or uh, Apple monitors, you're probably going to see those, those chips. If you don't, when, when you see the, the color bars out of resolve, you may want to get into the calibration part of your Apple and customize the application so you can see the slightest difference of brightness between the rightmost pluge and the middle pluge. The third one is even darker. If you see the middle one, it's too bright. If you don't see the right one, it's too dark. Um, there are also contrast adjustments and saturation adjustments. As much as possible, stay with what Apple gave you. Um, or if, if you have a Dell monitor. Uh, Dells are pretty good, but they, they, you have to custom. But it's pretty close to factory preset on yeah. those. Yes? Is it wise to invest in an X-Ride? Because you better yeah. touch the colors. Yes. No, it's a good idea to. And X-Ride is one of the calibration tools. Um, uh, x writes the best. That's a very good one. Um, there's a company called Lightspace out of London, and they sell you a system, too, that can calibrate through Resolve. It's rather expensive, but I, I think the x write is, is a good one to go with. There's a spider. Um, so using a professional scope, put the scope on your monitor and use the calibration, that, that's a good idea. Well, what are you making? You're making Rec. 709. For, you're making television. No. Most of it is web. Stay with Rec. 709. Yeah. yeah. Even, even within, within web, stay inside your Rec. 709 space. And until we get a, a Rec. 2020, ultra high def, you know, st stay with Rec. 709. Um, if you were doing cinema grading, you might want to get into, um, yeah. So, always start your day with a properly calibrated monitor, if you can. Uh, these are other test signals. This is, this is called um, SMPTE split field bars. 
this is EBU, full field bars. Uh, this is a gray scale. This is useful for um, looking for banding. Um, if you're using a probe calibrator, that's a good uh, te these test signals are available in your DaVinci Resolve. That you put your probe on the, the white square and it, and it calibrates differences between black and, and, the, and white in the contrast. This is just a flat field gray. Um, this is useful for looking for color contamination. So if on your, using your eyeballs you see any kind of residual color, then you know your, your monitor is out of calibration. That's, yeah, that looks good to me. There's, there's certain color, these are banding transitions. It's, it's not the monitor, it's, it's, it's the uh, bit depth of the signal. Okay, 1010, let's, let's skip ahead. Let's get going a little faster here. Um, Tools of the trade, there are various grading applications, DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut Pro, Premiere, Avid. We're going to use Resolve. And I won't say anything about the other ones except that Premiere is good. If you want to use Lumetri in Premiere, you know, not a bad idea. These are other professional applications. Um, you know, why buy them? You got a free, you got a free one. Uh, and uh, again, I'm sort of giving an odd to using Adobe, Lumetri. If you're uh, an effects person using After Effects, learning Lumetri will have an advantage for you. But the concepts that you learn in Resolve will apply themselves to what if you use um, Lumetri. Uh, a couple of other things. There is a digital color meter in your um, Apple application. You go into Utilities, Disk Utilities, bring down Color Meter, and that allows you to put a, an eyedropper on the screen to measure color. But you've got one right inside Resolve. Uh, you see that eyedropper over there, that qualifier? Click on that, then right click, and oops, no. All right, I seem to, I have to be in this secondary color mode. Oh, fool me. Yes, what I'm trying to get it to do. Ah, so get off that <laughs> and be in the application. I'm looking for the show picker RGB value. Select that, and now you can measure color with the eyedropper. If you are colorblind, you can be a colorist. You can, you can measure your signal. Uh, you can find black in the picture. And if there's any kind of contamination in the black color, it'll tell you with this pointer. If you don't have a pure white, you'll get an, another value there. And if you don't have a neutral gray, you'll know it. Why is that not a neutral gray? There's a contaminant. That should be one. Well, 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 we have, uh, my still is not color correct. Anyway, so if, even if I were colorblind, I would know that gray is wrong, and I would have to adjust that to get that to be pure gray. So those two color meters, the, the free one from Apple or the one in Resolve, are very good for helping you um, measure and if, if you're getting tired. You know, you can you know, try, to, try to use that to keep you constant. Uh, what's next? Okay, so that's a scope. Why did I want you to see that? Back to that. Okay, um, that shows the various scopes. Um, we'll talk about that in two. I guess I was really interested in teaching you where the scopes are. We'll do that in actual practice. There's the vector scope. Okay, let's get into color theory. That's a pure gray ramp uh, going from left to right. And um, it's measured on the, um, the scope over here. Let me switch over to here, turn my scopes on.
perfectly linear grayscale from black to white. Black to white on the waveform, the composite signal, the RGB are three different arcs. Um, that, there's a red channel that's doing that. That's just all red color, green color, blue color, and they composite to form uh, gray. That is a, a pure color of blue. So that's um, the beginning of hue, saturation, and luminance. The three variables of a, of a color are its hue value, its saturation, and its luminance. The luminance you're seeing here, this is this, this same, okay, there's the, the red, the, the, the gray here is this. The blue here, the luminance and chrominance is this. It only got that bright. And the green component got that bright. But the blue component went the full scale. So you've got less set, less uh, luminance there. You've got full luminance and that blue. That is another secondary color, yellow. I'm going to skip ahead and get into this. Saturation and luminance variations. So um, the color is composed of both a luminance uh, component and a saturation or a chrominance component, and that can vary by adding more luminance or by adding more saturation. And let's vary that with. Switch back to back to the edit mode. Okay, somewhere in my program I have a demonstration of as you raise luminance, how that will change. These are these are the individual separate color vectors. They'll make a little more sense when I get into the other portion of color theory. I, I just skip ahead. All right, measuring luminance and chrome. Look at the yellow strip here. And I'll turn the scopes on and watch how this yellow, which will be about here, you'll see a signal rise here. The, it'll, it'll probably rise up like this. It will get brighter because I'm adding luminance to it. And what it should happen is the luminance will make this go white. So there'll be more luminance to the color playing. Look at that change. So you, you saw how the luminance, I'll go backwards on that. It's over there on the right side of the screen. The luminance, it, adding light to the color washes out its saturation by this method. And then it drops black. Now we're going to add luma and chroma together. So as the saturation of the chroma comes up, the color can get brighter. So you can get a nice bright yellow. It happens to be broadcast legal at this point, broadcast safe, but I'm going to turn off on color management.
Oh, silly me. I mean, this is something I do every day. I should know exactly. It's just one little control. There, it's, it's under color management, it's right where I should have. It's down here, broadcast safe. Okay, I'll turn this off for a moment. I'm going to take a still picture of that yellow. It's there. And now I'm going to turn off the broadcast. I'm going to turn broadcast safe. Basically, that yellow is illegal or not safe for telecast. That, that was the color of the eyes of Count Zurg in, um, in Toy Story 3. Um, and that, that got me busted by Glenn Glenn Sound in LA. In the settings, under color management, if all of your work, you select that make broadcast safe, you're going to be fine. You don't have to worry about reading all these scopes. <laughs> Just, um, you know, check that box. All right, don't worry about that. Now, I'm going to play the still that I made. Now look at the, the white chip. I'm wiping back and forth. That is a broadcast safe yellow. That can go out on telecast, web, film. That can, be, that can go to film. Digital cinema isn't that restrictive. If, if you wanted to make your show with the brightest possible colors, you could turn off your broadcast safe switch and you could have that yellow. But for making for the web and, and for television, broadcast safe will do that. So the idea there is that there's both a luminance and a chrominance portion. And the chrominance portion of the signal can give you some trouble. But you don't have to worry about it if you just hit that broadcast safe switch. We're going to leave it on. Now. Um, the basic idea of color correcting, color correcting in film and video is it's both an additive and a subtractive. And you have three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Those are the primaries, which red opposes the mix of the other two. When green and, and blue are added together, they form cyan. Cyan is the complement of red, and they correct each other. When you add them together, they make white. So when you add two primaries, you create a secondary. Primary one, primary two, secondary. Red, blue, mix to make magenta. And then the other third primary is the complement of the other one. When you mix the secondary with the primary, you get white. That is subtractive color correction. Rather, the, the magenta and the green forming the white is a color subtraction. The blue and the green added together is an additive color correction. So you added two colors together, you, you created a color. Magenta and green subtracted. This is a case of, you know how we raised and lowered the luminance of the yellow? So these are all subtractive. The blue subtracted yellow, the red subtracted cyan, the magenta subtracted green, the green subtracted magenta, cyan subtracted red, yellow subtracted blue, but then I added light through it, luminance through it, and I preserved luminance in the RGB. So I have here an additive color correction. For the most part, I'd just say, just keep remembering there are th three primaries. Two of them combined will subtract the other. So if, you, if something's too red, you want to go towards cyan to correct red. Something's too blue, you want to add yellow or subtract blue. 
these were on here as test signals. I wanted to show you both the illuminance and, and, and chromas. I'm going to skip ahead. This, this is probably more than you need. Um, so in the next five minutes, I have to conclude my color space theory. Um, color space models. There are, there are two models. RGB 4444 is for film. If you were making content that was going to be filmed out or go out to a piece of film or, um, or go further into graphics compositing, if you're going to send this to an After Effects artist, you would want to output in the RGB 4444 color space. Those fours are alpha channel 4, RGB 4. The other model, this YCBCR, also called YUV, in the business, we just call it color difference. So, so there, it, 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 it is an English statement. So color difference 422 is composite television. It's Y, uh, y is the, the illuminance. UV is the chrominance. There are, two, there are three channels here. You get four bits of data for the Y channel because luminance is more important in our, in our visual perception. And then you have two bits of color for each of the color channels. One is made from subtracting color from, you know, U is made from subtracting B from luminance. V is created by subtracting red from luminance. But 422 is what you're going to make for Rec. 709, television, the web, 444, if we were in the day when we're going out to film, we might want to use that. Um, then we're, we'll get, talk about DCPs and DCIs in our, our next concept here. Um, so there are three different color spaces. There's the Rec. 709, which is television and will also work for web. Rec. 709 refers to high definition. There's an older color space called 601, which was standard definition. And for the most part, nobody is using that now. Some people ask for deliverables for certain stations and, and DVDs. DCI P3 is Digital Cinema Initiative um, color space. This is the color space for theatrical. Um, it is slightly different. It allows more colors than, than television does. And that's partly because of something called gamut, which we'll talk about in a second. Rec 2020 is ultra high definition. Um, and we're not quite there yet in delivering it. We're waiting for the broadcasters to decide on and, and agree on a standard. Um, for cinema, there is 4K cinema, though. So you can use 4K cameras and make Rec 709 television or 4K digital cinema packages, DCPs. Gamut is, is uh, uh, the world of color. These, the, these are color models. CIE 1931 is um, it's a French acronym, uh, Commission Internationale L'Eclairage. About, it's a gathering to talk about uh, standards for luminance and, and, and chroma science back in 1931, and they invented a color space called XYZ. A gamut is all the color you can see. This is a gamut chart. The large surfboard shape is, is um, CIE1931. These are all the colors the human eye can see. So like if you had a big box of paint colors, everything the eye can see fits inside that. Within that are other gamuts, more limited gamuts. This, more, uh, this larger gamut inside that is Rec. 2020. We can get a lot more colors from that color space if we had a device that could display it. So we're waiting for 4K television sets to come online. So you can get this super luminant green, these uh, beautiful aquatic colors, your, your skies and, and underwater photography colors will start coming when we can sh see that. Inside that, the solid one, 
is DCI. That's digital cinema can make these colors. So if you're watching, say you were working on Toy Story 2, and um, the toy maker Al is, is driving on, and suddenly you're in the cinema watching the work that you were doing in color correction in standard definition, and this hyperluminant uh, turquoise car comes by, it's because suddenly you can see in the theater colors in here that you were not able to see when you were working on it in a television system. So very exciting things happen here. I worked on a, a heavy metal uh, 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 sequence in a, a feature film, and, and suddenly all these hyperluminant cyans showed up from the concert when I saw it in a film, in a cinema. So you may want to be in a grading environment where you, you, you are projecting in that color space, particularly if you're adjusting subtle colors um, um, for that. But the main environment we're working in is this gamut. This is Rec. 709 television. D65 is the white point where all these colors converge. That little spot of white, although it's, it's black, underneath the black is, is white. That's D65, pure white balance, uh, daylight 6500K. So our goal is to make colors that work within the gamut. So besides broadcast safe, making a color that stays within broadcast rules that don't interfere with video sync and don't destroy the audio, we want to make a color that will appear on a device. So I don't want to violate a gamut. I don't want to make a color here that I can't show on my client's television, on their web page. Um, it really gets more crucial in advertising, like when you're, you have a car company. Uh, I used to do car ads in the, in the 80s in standard definition. When I, they were painting all the cars this um, teal color, it absolutely would not show on a television set. Uh, Rex 601 television would not produce that color. And I'd have an advertising agency from Detroit, Michigan with the new Ford, and they'd, they'd show me their print out of the car, and this is the car color, and I said, and this is television. And, and I'd move the dial, and it'd go from a nice deep blue to a nice deep green, and there was nothing in between. And they got on the phone with Detroit, said, what do we do? And we made it blue for the commercial. High definition comes along, that color appears in Rec. 709. So let's you know, say hooray for Rec. 2020. We will be able to make interesting colors that we haven't seen in even high definition television. And uh, I think we'll stop there. <laughs>